So actually, let me start. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Diego Sanchez Ancochea. I'm um, head of the Department of International Development, um, which um, together with the Laudato Si Institute um, and Campion Hall is uh, organizing this uh, event. Um, it's fantastic to have you all um, for uh, what I think would be a great conversation uh, on how to fight inequality. Um, the, the idea is, is very much to think um, not so much about why inequality is a problem and not so much about um, some of its consequences or some um, even of the policies, but very much to think about um, the politics and, and the, um, the construction of movements and processes um, to try to um, fight what um, those of us at least in the panel, think is one of the problems of, or one of the most significant problems of the 21st um, century. Um, let me also say that um, we are recording the event and we ideally would like to um, uh, publish at least some of the um, discussion in the web. So if anyone has any problems with that, uh, it would be great, A, if you can switch off the, your cameras, but also if you can uh, email me and, and Joe about it. Um, but, but that's, that's the, the, the objective to, to try to maximize um, the, the impact of, of the discussion. So let me, um, with, uh, and the other thing I wanted to, to tell you is that we are going to try to organize this uh, as much as a conversation as possible. Um, and that's partly also why we didn't want to have a webinar, but we wanted to have everyone in the room and see your names and, and your images when um, you ask questions. Um, so we will start with uh, me asking some questions to each of the panelists. Um, um, they, and depending on how extensive they are in their answers, I will follow up with another question or um, I will move to um, the next one. And then after around 30 minutes, um, I will actually, um, or we will actually move to, to the audience and to questions and comments. And what we ho hope it's a lively discussion um, as I say, about thinking about the politics and, and, and the role of social movements and most of their processes uh, in reducing income inequality. So it's a fantastic pleasure for me to, to actually um, have the opportunity to introduce um, two old friends and then um, two people I, I have just met, but I have been very impressed with, with their work for some time. Uh, ben Phillips, who is um, very much... Um, one of the brains on, of this event is a social activist and NGO leader. Um, he was co-founder of Fight Inequality Alliance um, and um, has actually previously to that had worked in a number of, of NGOs um, on um, development policy. Um, he is also um, the author of How to Fight Inequality and Why the Fight Needs You, um, which um, has been uh, an influential book in the last a uh, few months on thinking precisely about the question we are discussing today about what are the political needs or the political requirements to be successful um, in the reduction of inequality. On a more personal basis, although I know uh, that will be less interesting for the audience, he's actually responsible or partly responsible for me writing one, what I consider now one of the most important chapters of my own book on inequality, where I discuss some of the good lessons and not just the bad lessons from Latin America. Um, second, uh, Pilato is the Zambia's leading um, hip hop artist. Um, he's also a, a leader in movements to tackle inequality and to fight the abuse of um, power. Uh, his sons um, have uh, been very popular with the public, but much less so with those in power. Um, and he actually has been uh, arrested and threatened um, at uh, several points in his very successful career. Severin Deunelin, who is co-organizer of this event, um, is a senior lecturer in international development at the University of Bath, and um, more important for us, director of international development at the Laudato Si Research Institute in Camden Hall here at Oxford, uh, and actually an associate of uh, our department as much as an alumni of the department where she did the PhD. Um, she has taught very extensively um, about issues of um, development and development thinking, particularly regarding um, the role of human development, the capabilities approach, and the role of Catholic church and religion more generally 
in the process of development. And last but not least, um, Jafar Salchi, uh, born in Iran, is a Danish um, a multimillionaire construction and real estate entrepreneur. He's um, the founder of uh, Millionaires for Humanity, which is a global um, group of um, high income individuals advocating for um, a, the taxation of the rich um, to actually try to uh, overcome not just the crisis of development, but also the COVID crisis and the COVID pandemic that affects us. So as I say, um, it's a pleasure to actually have now the possibility of asking you some questions. Thank you so much for coming. And as I tell many other events, when I organize them, I do hope that we can welcome properly to Oxford and not just to an Oxford screen um, in um, the months or years to come. So Ben, let me start with you, if I may. Um, you have actually written a book uh, thinking precisely about this question, but also have a long extensive career in thinking on more practical terms about uh, the question I'm going to ask you. What, what does social action need uh, to be successful um, in fighting uh, the uh, reduction and in proposing the reduction of inequality? Thanks, Diego. Um... Yeah, I think the key challenge where I started from in, in terms of the question of the book is they need to think about how they're going to win, not just about what they want. So let's just take as read, because now you can't get past a World Bank report without reading this on page one or two. Inequality is harmful. Inequality needs to be tackled. Government's got to do something about it. We know roughly the list of policies and all governments in the world are pledged to do it. So why it's not happening? That's the question that civil society needs to focus on how to get change. And it's not about repeating the arguments about why inequality is bad. It's about thinking through and learning, including learning from the past, which is what I tried to do in my book, learning from the past about when has inequality been beaten before? What are the lessons of history? And when I look back at the 21st and the 20th century, in every continent, I found three common lessons of a story of how you get to beat inequality and the starting point is that it's never given it's never something governments and leaders give it's always one it's always a story of pressure from below being an absolutely fundamental necessary condition for change so how do you win through that pressure from below the first seems to be you need to be willing to get into what congressman john lewis called good trouble a lot of civil society organizations now really worry if they get an angry phone call from a government minister. But actually, that seems to be one of the first tests of success. I couldn't find an effective social movement that had reduced inequality that wasn't, at the beginning of its work, criticized by the establishment for being too radical. Right now, people say, why can't Black Lives Matter be like Martin Luther King? But in 1966, 63% of Americans said that Martin Luther King was divisive. The suffragettes who only asked that women have the vote were called dangerous by the New York Times. The indigenous movements of Bolivia or the landless workers movements of Brazil were all seen as dangerous, far too radical, troublemakers, didn't understand economics until they started to drive uh, real change. So be willing to be a troublemaker seems to be condition number one. Condition number two is that you have to build power, have to build power. We've seen that when countries reduce inequality, it's often when they have very, very high levels of trade union density, that is more and more people belong to a union because working class people and middle class people are never powerful on their own, only in groups. So whether that's forming unions, whether that's forming people's organizations, whether that's forming uh, women's uh, associations or uh, progressive faith groups, whatever it is, you need to be part of something. Reverend William Barber talks about fusion coalitions, those groups of groups coming together. And the third condition seems to be to set a story, to set a narrative, not just to list the policies. The great trade union leader, Joe Hill said, a pamphlet, however well written, is read once and then put away, but a song is learnt by heart and sung again and again. There's a brilliant movie, Roma, Mexican movie, and we saw it together, um, Diego, and I hope many others have seen it. It was really effective in all sorts of ways, but one of the ways is this. It helped to tip over the line a really important legislative change in Mexico, uh, strengthening the rights of domestic workers for the first time. And yet in the movie, there are zero policy demands. 
because what it did was it changed the conversation that a country was happening was having so if civil society organizations want to be effective they have to be willing to be troublemakers they have to build power together and they have to be storytellers these seem to be the lessons of our ancestors on whose shoulders we stand thank you so much ben so um let me ask you actually i'm going to ask you two questions and and you can choose in a way which which of those the first is and you touch upon at the end is what is the role of narrative so mm. so um how i mean clearly power is important taking people in the street is important but um what's the role of narratives and is it so true that we have won the narrative around inequality yet or not actually let me let me ask you first and if I, that we have so, time we we'll ask you the other we've won we've won the intellectual argument we haven't won the narrative and the narrative is a different thing narratives about story um i tell you who was great at winning narrative our opponents the neoliberals absolutely brilliant they had the most demonstrably unsuccessful policy at improving the lives of ordinary people the average um uh, um white american male has had no improvement no improvement whatsoever in their wages since 1975 and 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 yet um uh they were able to secure uh, for neoliberal policies um a series of successive victories of overtly um neoliberal politicians from the right but also politicians from the center left felt unable to ever deconstruct um uh, the, the neoliberal project because the story was so successful and the storyteller was Ronald Reagan a movie actor right he's much more influential than say somebody like Milton Friedman who was neoliberal neoliberalism great intellectual so we have to be much better storytellers we have to get to the heart of the narrative when we think about the welfare state in britain for example just that phrase wasn't a politician or a think tanker who invented that it was the archbishop of canterbury william temple so it's often about finding that 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 key moral core that key story about the kind of society that you want to build we've got to take people away from the idea that we find our fullest expression by uh, on our own by being left alone um we have to rediscover that actually as individuals we flourish most effectively through strong societies that's the story argument that we need to win so i think we've won the intellectual case we need to go beyond that and be much much more effective storytellers perfect oh, that's that's extremely useful and the separation between obviously narratives and policies um important to remember for academics as well so let me ask you last question which obviously thinking about the world today and thinking about the us in particular but not just it's important um and you might disagree with me but there's a presumption in in the book that the people will want uh, progressive policies that the people will take the streets on those areas but of course we know that the people can take the streets for many other reasons and that in some countries maybe they are taking them some groups are taking it for almost the opposite reasons um to actually prevent more racial equality and even more income equality what do we do with that how how do you choose when social movements or when people in the streets are uh, the good guys or when they are actually less constructive and and isn't that the people as well that's that's a that's a that's a fair uh, a fair challenge and a fair point and i think especially in crisis moments um all sorts of things become possible but they become possible in every direction um so you, you it, it's uh, it's impossible to explain the success of the new deal era in america that's the 1930s when franklin d roosevelt gets into office we see the most progressive government america's ever had it's impossible to understand that that the wall street crash and yet it's also impossible to understand the rise of um, nazism and uh, um, fascism in central europe without the wall street crash too so we know that crises can push things either way and this covid crisis could do either um in uh Rutger Bregman's beautiful book Human Kind he talks about how as people we're a pack animal right and that can take us in a way in two directions very rarely actually does it take us to ideological neoliberalism very if you ask if you poll for example should wages go up for the poor and should taxes go up on the rich you get overwhelming percentages in favor of those in the 60s and 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 you get a majority support amongst center right voters as well as center left So it's not really that and that's exactly why hard right politicians don't run on that they don't run on greed is good 
they run on nationalism. They run on uh, uh, religious um, uh, uh, kind of identitarianism. They run on um, fear of social and cultural change. And we have both of those. We all have both of those in, in, inside us. And there is a very well-resourced project to fund pushing people off from a project that's about how we win together and into a project about how we push some out. So there's a real threat. I'm, on the one hand, really excited about how possible change is right now, even in the, and, and in a way because of the painful situation we're in, I can feel that in a way, as an optimist, isn't it wonderful that things are possible that used to seem so difficult to do? But I know as well that frankly, in the meeting halls of fascists around the world, they're feeling the same. They, they get that too. They get that this is their moment too. And so one of the reasons why I think we, who want a more equal society, need to organize now is it's not just that we need to replace this unfair, brutal system that kicks people out with one that's more just, but it's that if we don't organize, that system that's dying might actually be replaced by something even even uglier. Um, so we need both to prevent their rise and to enable a rise of, of all of us, of society as a whole. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, that, that, that's a whole set of very good issues to, to start with and to questions. And I have to say, it was also very nice to um, hear the birds singing um, in the back. Um, it actually, that in itself is a sign of optimism. So let me stop you um, for a second and move to Pilato, if I may. Um, so we, I don't think the signaling is, is particularly good. Um, so I think, uh, Pilato, I'm going to move to Severin and maybe you can, you can hang up and try to, to connect again. And if, if this continues like this, as sounds frustrating, maybe we can use the chat um, to have a conversation with you as well, which would be great. Um, but let me move to you, Severin. Um, as I, I said, um, your work is very much um, around um, thinking about um, specific actors, but also academics and how they frame some of these debates, but also about religion and the Catholic Church in, in developing in general inequality in particular. So um, could you tell us a little about how you think some of those ideas and actors can contribute to the reduction of inequality? Mm -hmm. Thank you. But yeah, I will disagree slightly with Ben. Um, you know, your argument was that it's not so much about what we want, but how to win. But I would say that it is about first thinking, what do we want? In which space um, should we fight inequality? And, and as some, you know, you know, I've worked a lot on uh, MRGSN for a long time and I've been inspired by him every, ever since I, I read for the first time uh, an article by him when I was in, in economics. Um, but it's his seminal article in the late 70s, in, in the late 70s called Equality of What? And I don't think we have answered that question yet. So if we fight inequality, what should we fight about? And I noticed that when Diego introduced the session, um, you said it's about reducing income inequality. And you know, we had had a, quite a long discussion about, you know, why should we focus on income inequality? Is this the right space? And what you know, Amartya Sen, is, as probably many of you know, you know when, when he asked, you know, if we are concerned about equality, what should we be concerned about? Should we be concerned about income equality? Should we be concerned about equality of resources? Should we just all have one car, all have one house, and that's it? Uh, should we be or should we be concerned about something else? And you know, he's been very well known for introducing his idea of capabilities. You know, his argument is that if we are concerned about equality, we should be concerned about here the space of of capabilities. That is what people are able to do and be. That every human being, by virtue of human being, by virtue of being human should be able, should be given the same opportunities to be and do what, what he said was she or has reason to value. Uh, and he gives them some basic, uh, basic capabilities like just being able to be in good health, 
being able not to 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 die of a preventable disease. You know, it is wrong that a child in in Kenya is 20 times more likely to die um, before five than a child in, uh, in in Denmark, for example. I'm not sure that the statistics right, but anyway, the, the proportion, uh, you get the picture. Um, uh, the inequality of voice, that it is not right that some people are able to have too much voice and to direct policies in a way that others do not. And, and then looking at what the Human Development Report has done on, on the capability approach, I'm using uh, Amartya Sen's ideas for thinking about inequality, um, and especially the latest report talks about power inequality, that what we, are, what we should be concerned about is, is first, first of all, power inequality. And in that sense, income inequality is, is very important um, that we should fight it because income inequality gives too much power to some individuals. And I don't know, we have, we have had a, a discussion before now, is, inequality, is income inequality immoral um, even if it didn't lead to power inequality? And, and my, my own view is that no, income inequality is, would not be immoral if everybody else is is able to have the same opportunities and, and the same voice. Um, I don't know, we, we can disagree on that. But I think there is a further question to be asked, um, inequality, equality of what? Um, before we can start the fight. Uh, and you know, when Ben, when you mentioned this idea of, of a coalition, um, where you called the, um, what is exactly the name, but you use the fusion coalition. You mentioned the civil rights movement in the US. Well, they all had, they were very clear about what they wanted. They wanted to have equal treatment, um, equal opportunities, whatever the color of skin. And I don't think we have that consensus yet about how to fight inequality. Uh, and, and that may be a reason why it's so difficult to, to build a narrative um, around, around inequality or on how, how the fight of inequality. And I just want to, to say just two more things. Um, just Diego asked me you know, what, which author um, had kind of inspired me. And one is, not, is a title of a book that Jerry Cohen, uh, a political philosopher in Oxford who died um, a few years ago, sadly. He wrote this book called, If You Are an Egalitarian, How Come You Are So Rich? And now the book deals with, well, if we're concerned about redistribution, what is the site of redistribution? Um, which, what, which institutions are we concerned about? And his argument was saying that, well, we need to be concerned about institutions, but also about, about ourselves. And, um, and that's something that you know, I find a lot of, of inspiration from um, Pope Francis' writings. Um, and the whole kind of a tradition of, of the, the Catholic social tradition um, uh, about structural change and personal change and how you link the two. And you know, that's been one of the main argument of Pope Francis as well, that, that, um, that we need to change hearts. Um, and then that links to the issue of narrative about the song. The song brings some emotional commitment that an intellectual argument will, will never have. You know, Amartya Sen didn't have these brilliant papers. Um, we didn't have these brilliant arguments about why, why we need to fight power inequality and why we need to fight income inequality. Um, but why is it not happening? Because we haven't linked with the, the affective component. I think the same argument can be said about climate change. We know the facts. The there's Gupta report um, of what two weeks ago said about biodiversity loss. We've lost 80% of biodiversity. Um, the IPCC keeps saying it's last goal, last goal. Actually, we're losing the last goal, um, but we're not doing it. Why? Why? Um, and I think this is this, this missing element of the affective, uh, emotional dimension, um, and you know what. Um, well, the Catholic tradition is emphasizing, or religious traditions are all emphasizing, is this idea of interconnectedness, that we all share one planet, a common home. And, and sometimes I wonder whether we are fighting the right battle. Um, do we have to fight income inequality? Or if we fight our survival on our common home, 
if we if we, if we put all our energies into that, um, because we know that in 50 years time, or even less than that, in 30 years time, we will face major, major disruptions to our life. COVID-19 is absolutely nothing compared to, to what climate change will, will bring to us. Um, whether we should build a narrative around, around that, a narrative of hope as well, uh, and not a narrative of, of gloom, a narrative of, 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 yeah, of hope and, and success. Um, and I think I'll, I'll stop it there. So, so let, me, let me just a quick follow up on, and I mean, I, there's a lot um, that you agree with Ben around the importance of emotions and narratives. So I think it's, it will be important to pick up on some of these issues if the audience wants later. But let me pressure you. I mean, I think you make a very good case of why um, income is a tool or an instrument. But let me, let me also at the same time ask you how much time should we lose on this when we know that the top 1% in the US, not everyone else, not the upper middle class, not other groups in society, but had actually increased their income share from 10 to 20%. So they control one fifth of everything that is being produced. In Chile, um, we know that the top 1% controls around one third of everything that is being produced. Um, so independently, and, and we know that this is totally linked as you were saying with political, um, with political power. So don't we run the risk of spending a lot of time on discussions of what's the right level of income at which we should worry, et cetera, uh, or is this about ethics or is it about, while the key is that there's a huge concentration of income that is increasing with all the implications on other areas um, that are quite evident as well. Yeah, it comes back to the question about, you know, why are we so tolerant about this? And Probably one one argument that we, we are not winning the battle is that are we convinced that this is a problem? Why why is it a, prob a problem that a third of what is produced in Chile um, is in the hands of a few families? Uh, what is our outrage at that? Why should we be outraged? You know, and, um, we had this opportunity you know, just after the financial crisis in 2009, about under one, the 99%, um, and there's this French intellectual um, who wrote this little book about uh, Indignez-vous, or in Spain, Los Indignados, um, that we, we, I don't know, in English, where we be Los Indignados, the, uh, um, that we are shocked. We, we, this is, but have societies reach that level that this is not tolerable? And, and is it then a question of going back to the narratives? Um, how do we frame these narratives? Are we still in the neoliberal model of meritocracy? You know, that, well, we've worked hard. Um, it's not my problem. Um, and, and how do we, do we foster that, that sense that, that the fact that a third of the production of a country is in the hands of a few people? Um, why is that a problem? Uh, mm -hmm. And until we have answered that, I don't think we can mobilize uh, to change the state of affairs. Perfect, thank you so much, Severin, and a lot to obviously discuss when we open it up for questions. Um, so Pilato, going back to you, a lot has been said about emotions. Of course, art and artists are all or partly about emotions. So again, what do you think is the role of artists in all of these and um, what are the main channels or the main processes based on your own experience uh, through which this happens? So first of all, we must understand that art is life uh, in a simplified form. So art itself provides uh, the smoothness of life. Uh, the, the food, the clothes that we eat, that we wear, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, is somewhat a product of creativity, somewhat a product of art. The designer will design the clothing, your designer will design your, your shoe. Uh, the architecture will design the shape and uh, fashion for your house or for your office. So there's artists involved everywhere. And art as from Talk memorial to today, art has influenced our perception of life, our perception and understanding of things. 
art has told us which brand is better than the other. We, we can now choose a better phone between the other because it was talked about in a, in a movie. Or it, if art has so much power that it can influence how we perceive things, how we perceive life and experience life, then it should have power to construct or reduce life or society that all of us could find, could, could, could go home. We, we can use this art to build a more equal society. And when I say equal society, I'm, much, I, 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 I'm, I'm specific, I mean economic equality because inequality, like it has been said, has so many faces. My engagement as an artist and my discussion as an artist is, is mainly on economic inequality because I'm, I live in a country where if you are poor, you are denied even access to basic things. You cannot go to a hospital and find medication. You cannot go to a hospital and find a doctor if you do not have money. So economic inequality is my main thing. And if we are going to engage, if we're going to discuss, if we're going to advocate for a more equal society, it has to be done in a language that people and people understand. Like subjects, it could be an academic, a uh, profession, or I don't, I don't know other things that we could call it, but inequality is an issue that the people at the bottom do not just hear about, but experience and live as part of their everyday experiences. So music, because music can be consumed by the people at the top, can be consumed by the people at the bottom, at, in the middle, and the people at the bottom. If music is such powerful, if music has so much power to to interact with people in different uh, social classes, then we have power to speak to all the three uh, groups of people. If all these three groups of people are listening to our music, then it is our responsibility as artists to propagate and project the message of equality. If we live in a society that uh, we have power, if our people, if our leaders have the power to make national budgets, then they have the power to decide who goes to bed without a meal. The people, if we have the power to make our own budgets, if we have the power to sit and design our own budgets, it is that power that decides who goes to school tomorrow, who doesn't deserve a school, who doesn't deserve medication, who doesn't deserve a decent shelter, because as we share, as we allocate these resources in our national budgets, we are deciding. We are deciding who deserves the hospital education. We are deciding who doesn't. But for people at the bottom, they may not have the opportunity to speak to the media, speak to the BBC, speak to whichever media institution, just as much as the people at the top may, 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 may have the opportunity. But the music, music it cuts across these classes. If I, as an artist, have the power to make a song that can be listened to by the people at the top and the people at the to make sure that I project the concerns, it's my project, my, my responsibility exactly that the people at the top will hear what I'm what I'm what, what I'm putting out in the in, in the music. So that for me, that it starts from there. If art and music is has got that power to damage society, then music should have power to construct and build society. Thank you very much. We mute, I'm mostly mute, sorry. That was extremely useful. So can I ask you a follow-up question, which is when you look at your own career and your own action, what what is the the instance that you are most proud of? The instance that made most of a difference was it the song? Was it actually an interview in a newspaper? Was it a festival? What what do you think has made most difference and why uh, in that process that you described so nicely? Uh, I think I think for me the most the most uh, prominent. Uh, episode, the moment was when I knew that I defended the president of Zambia. <laughs> when I defended the president, I knew that uh, 
whatever I put out in the music was being heard by the president. It was more like a confirmation. So when I speak about addressing issues, social issues, I knew and I still know today that the president is listening to me. So if the president is listening to me, what's my message? Am I going to talk about Bugatti and Lamborghini and all of that? That's a waste of time and energy. If the president is listening to me, I have a responsibility to communicate the right message to him. I have to tell him what is happening in our, uh, in our ghetto. I have to tell him what is happening in our streets. I have to tell him what's happening in our town. So when he got upset and decided that they could arrest me, for me, that was the sign to say, you, you, we, they are hearing you, they got your message, and they are upset with, with you because you must be disturbed their comfort, but they got your message, which is for me. That's fantastic. And, and in a way, it's not to speak truth to power, but sing, sing truth to power. And I think it's, it, it reveals very nicely uh, exactly everything you were, you were saying and then links very nicely with this issue of emotions, but narratives as well. So thank you um, so much. And last but not least, I, I wonder whether I can go to you, Jaffer, and um, ask you to reflect a little on um, the role of the business elites and the business sector uh, in this effort to fight and reduce inequality. Um, from the outside, it would seem like uh, a very difficult battle to win, um, not just because of narratives, but also because of power. But obviously you think that is less of a battle, or at least you are fighting that battle. So what do you think should be the role and how do we get there? If we see back in history, I think it's obvious all big changes through history have come from below. But I think it's extremely important that we are, some of us at the top, that is uh, willing to come together and push for not just to give back uh, like we do in our philanthropy, because uh, many has done it, I do it, it is beautiful, but the I think most of us do it because it's the right thing to do. And beside that, I think it would be extremely helpful from the lead side to push that, as uh, Ben was talking about, but the real change would come from below. So what we are trying in Meters for Humanity to do is actually to get the few that I think we can get from the top to come together and just be in a platform, in a network, where we come out with our voice, come together and say, yes, we are doing our philanthropy work, but we are not afraid to go ahead with structural changes that will say, tax us a little bit more so we can solve the problem. Because the problem is not here that uh, the world don't, don't have enough resources. If you look uh, at the global wealth, we are very close to have $400 trillion. And the top 1% have more than half of it in their hands. So imagine just 1% of the top one will give you nearly $2 trillion, more than enough to solve all our, all our problems. So we just need to come together and push from below and from the top to make structural changes. When we are talking about what is inequality, for me, inequality is why do we have 1 billion people living under $2 a day? Why do we have 6 million children under six years, every year dying? of disease or not enough food or not clean water and whatsoever. Imagine 6 million children every year under six years old. That is inequality for me. Or the 265 million children that don't go to school. And we calculated with the United States Sustainable Development Goals two years ago, 
that imagine if you took just 1% of the world's billionaire, we have about 2,200 of them, with a total wealth of $10 trillion. So 1% will give us 100 billion. Enough, actually, to put this 265 million children in school. Enough to save 6 million children under six years every year and not dying. For me, that's inequality. So for me, it's, let's start with no hanging fruit on the tree and then work up after. So, uh, and one of the other biggest problem for me is, is not that we are rich and have a lot of money actually, but the real problem for me is that the 0.01% of the wealthiest on this planet is actually buying their politicians. So our democracies are under pressure. And that is the big danger. I think you all know that the, there was two professors in 2016 in the US that make a big report about after an election, the US, how much has the top 1% and how much have the rest? It was like, yeah, <laughs> and 90% of the population has something like 10% and the top 1% yeah, decided the rest because behind every senator in the U.S. is a billionaire. And now we just had a billionaire four years in the office, like Trump. So that is the danger for me. We, we don't want the money to run our politicians. We have to keep the money out of that because we don't want to lose our democracies. And that is why actually one of the biggest things why I'm fighting against this, because... For me, it is the right thing to do. That, that's and fantastic. then, uh, yeah. Go, go. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Um, so so yeah. I think you made a very, very clear case and especially a case of a normative case. But of course, all, some of your colleagues, um, I'm thinking about Bill Gates and others would say, we agree with you. That's, those are the goals. But we think philanthropy is much better because um, we know better. Um, because the Gates Foundation can innovate, because it can be more flexible, because it doesn't have as much corruption and as much inefficiencies about governments. So how would you respond to that? And why would um, to try to go with the whole tax agenda? Um, and why is that more important uh, for you in many ways than the philanthropy agenda? Yeah, now you self-mentioned Bill Gates. So I can give you the example because I actually talked to him at the UN in 2019, September 2019, and asked him exactly the same. And he was still at that time like, I can do a lot more for myself. But if you look again from the helicopter, the total philanthropic world combined in our planet today is something about $24, $25 billion. And that is just not enough. If you look to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that all countries sign that we know we should solve has a total gap, financial gap of $3 trillion. So how can $24 billion a year solve our problems? This is impossible, you know? So that's why we are saying in our Foundation Human Act and Millions for Humanity, Let's make our philanthropy work. It's beautiful. It's good. It's the right thing to do. But we must have structural changes. And the only way to do that is by a tax. So we say, come on, let's put 1% levy and put to the SDGs. Because we have to solve not only poverty or food problems, or, or, but we need climate change. We need to stop the wars. We need, that's why the SDGs are so important. And that kind of money cannot come from philanthropy. That is impossible. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you to the four of you. There's a lot of things to discuss. There's a, there's a lot of elements that I think are very common and uh, make for a coherent uh, whole around the importance of narratives, around the importance of power, around uh, the importance of pressure from below and from above. There's obviously also um, some things to discuss and some useful disagreement uh, around what is that we are fighting for. Um, and there's 
there's obviously the issue of, of who is the enemy and we should be listened by the wealthy or by um, the president or someone else. Let me open it for questions. Um, you can obviously write it on the chat, as you know, but um, we really wanted to make this event as uh, participatory as, pro as possible. So ideally, if you don't mind actually raising your hand and asking the question as you would do in, in uh, real life, um, that would be fantastic. But if not, if you prefer to write it on the chat, I will pick those up as well. And there's a couple. Um, so let me open it up for questions. Um, Sol and Judith with two questions. Um, I don't know if any of you two want to actually ask them or would you prefer that I read them aloud? Um, Hi. Judith, yes. Oh, sorry. Go, go, Judith. Oh, you, you, you go first. <laughs> oh, sorry, I saw Judith first, but I saw that Sol. So let me go, Judith, with you first, because I saw you in the, I have you here and then Sol, please. Thank you. And, and thanks to everyone on the panel. It's been some, a really, really fascinating conversation. That's at, and actually, as it's gone on, I think it started to address the question I put in the chat, actually. But um, but even so, I'd be, really value your, your reflections on it. I think you know a lot of the early conversation was around this sort of sense of how you build an effect campaign and this notion of kind of grassroots activism and how you know how you kind of build from the bottom but I suppose for me it, it's it's still about nailing down are we clear on what it is we want to, to governments and other policymakers to do I know we want we've got a reasonably clear idea of the end state what it is we want to work towards but you know to take a UK kind of slant on that what what is it we would be asking for? Is it I don't know is it universal basic income? Is it you know changes to the tax and you know redistributive what do we distribute? Sorry, the words up a more redistributive tax system or or what? I don't know what what is it? It's, it's really difficult. I feel trying to sort of um, distill that and also just lastly, I mean I um I work for a local authority and I'm really interested in what action you think perhaps can be taken at a sub national level. What does local action look like around this? Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Um, Sol. Hi, yes, uh, my question was more for Severine um, and around the, the issue of uh, capabilities as an approach and is, does it, is it not the case that uh, in, from my perspective, it seems like the outcomes of those capabilities are ultimately what seems to be more actionable and uh, an easier target to focus on. And working within this approach, as you have, have you never found that focusing on capabilities per se, does that not risk being a bit hypothetical and being co-opted by groups in power who can always argue that because capabilities are hard to measure and, and they're a bit abstract, that uh, disadvantaged groups in fact do have these capabilities, but somehow fail to to achieve the same outcomes and what what would it mean for someone in in a disadvantaged community or a lower income country to have the capability to have a healthy life but not have it why would that um happen and how is that so thank you so much all so we have now a list of of people wanting to ask other questions but let me actually go back to you before we accumulate um we have discussed, obviously, about how we convince people, about policy, about um, inequalities of what. So in a way, it links to how you were discussing. So uh, I guess if, if each of you could respond in two or three minutes whatever, to whatever you want from either what each other have said or from these three questions, that would be great. And I'm actually going to start by the same order, given that Ben has been um, waiting for a long time and also that I want to hear the birds as well. So Ben. Um, your your term. Thank you. And they were such great questions. So, firstly, on the policy list, that's a very fair, a very fair um, uh, uh, challenge and point. Um, and it, the policy list is not that complicated. The thing is that there isn't one policy. So, when I look back at history, at when governments had reduced inequality, they could never do it with one policy alone. It's interesting that when people talk about the success of Lula's government in Brazil in reducing inequality. They often talk about one policy, which was Bolsa Familia, which is putting money in the hands of, of people. And the basic income grant has become a very popular idea in Silicon Valley. The fact is, if Lula had only done that, inequality would not have gone down. 
that it's the package of policies. But then the package of policies is not that complicated. So putting money in the hands of people is great. That can be basic income, child benefit, old age pensions, whatever it is, but putting money in the hands of people is a good part of it. Also, raising wages, which you can do through minimum wage legislation or through trade union rights legislation or through labor inspectors and improving rights of people at work. That's also important. Redistributing land is really important, especially if you've got an agricultural um, uh, or feudal type society. Tackling discrimination against women, against black people, against ethnic minorities, also really important, whether that's through um, legislation that um, uh, punishes and prohibits discrimination and better through legislation that's, that's more affirmative action that starts to uh, redress uh, some of those challenges. Universal public services, really, really key. When you talk about health, education, water, public transport, for so many reasons. One is, at the moment, there's a kind of reverse tax, a regressive tax on the poor. If you don't have free health care, then actually poor people end up paying uh, uh, higher amounts of their of their of their income uh, towards it. So there's a financial benefit to free uh, healthcare and education. There's also a massive social development benefit. And there's also a cultural benefit because when kids go to school together, when people use the bus together, when we go to hospital together, then we're a nation. If we're all on separate transport, in separate hospitals, in separate schools, in what sense are we a community? Just because people, some people from the poor community come and work in the houses of some people from the rich community, that doesn't make one nation. You make a nation when the kids go to school together. Amartya Sen talks beautifully in India about free school meals. And he says it's not just that it gets the kids not hungry and it makes the kids learn. He says it brings the kids of different castes to commune together, to eat together as one for the first time. So that's some of the, of, of the policy mix. But honestly, I think you could hire a consultant and for a week that of work, they could give you a policy mix. The, the frustrating thing is that when we look back at history, how rarely has that policy mix been implemented? And what I found was that it was never ever done just because we NGO people handed over a good paper to decision makers. And the reason it didn't is because of Peter's reason, because policymaking in the end is not driven by evidence. It's driven by balance of power. So the reason why organizing is needed, and I talk about more organizing more than activism, because sometimes activism is done by a few, but for, for change to be successful, organizing has to be done by the many. And the reason why organizing is so key is unless you shift power, you don't shift politics and policy. Again, to refer to Amartya Sen, you know, Amartya Sen says, when did famine stop in India? Not because of a policy, not because of a theory, and not because of anything he wrote. Famine stopped in India once Indians were in charge of India. Power. And it's the same. When you, at, at the moment, we have concentrations of wealth in the world that mean we don't really have democracy. And so we have to break that concentration of wealth and shift power to below because only then do we actually have a functioning politics. So to Peter's question, I would say, and sadly, you know, don't, don't wait for the good politicians because they're not coming, but also even if they do, even the good politicians need the pressure. Lyndon B. Johnson famously said to Martin Luther King, look, I know what I have to do, but you still have to make me do it. Without the pressure, the change doesn't happen. And I think what I would say in terms of persuading people is a big argument's not gonna work. A kind of broadcast debate where you say to people, hey, don't you realize the economy's rigged? That doesn't work. The record is that doesn't work. What does work is you help people organize small about something that matters to them, like their wages in their factory or their job, like their local school, like their local health center or their local lake or park, which is under threat. And you help people win something small through people power. And the victory that they, that they make, which is really important, they get a better school, they get uh, uh, more, more books in the school or they fix the roof or the, the government can't poison their local lake, that victory is beautiful. But what's even more beautiful is that they start to see that power ultimately is theirs when they work with other people. So I think that if change will happen, it will be through that patient process of organizing. So that's so I really link Judith's questions and, and, and Peter's, because I think the policy mix is really key. You're absolutely right. Inequality doesn't go down unless a government makes it go down, but a government doesn't make inequality go down unless the people make the government make 
the poverty and inequality go down. And the people don't have the capability to make the government do that unless the people organize. And, and that's why a, a conversation that often starts out with what is inequality, what, can, you know, what needs to be done, what's the policy mix, that if we only end with a proposition that in the end is basically saying versions of, please emperor, will you do this? We never win. We only win when we're strong. Jay Naidu, he ran the trade union movement that helped bring down apartheid in South Africa. And he was talking to me about, you know, his work as a trade union negotiator. And he said, Ben, they never really cared yes. about the quality of our argument. You know, they cared about how powerful we were compared to how powerful they were. And um, he says, no one sees power from a PowerPoint. So, so I think that, that those of us, and I'm massively interested in policy because I see the, the, the absolute transformative power of it. Those who care about policy and care about the allocation of resources that Diego talked about, unless we're organizing, then we're just talking. Then we're just gonna become ever more expert commentators on why the world is getting worse. When we can be planners for making the world better. Um, thank you so much, Ben. Um, and and it, what you just said echoes what Francis Stigler was writing about, and I have heard you, Ben, saying, I think it's important on this issue of effective action around specific issues as then building into, into other elements. Severin. Um, no, actually, I fully agree with, with Ben starting small, uh, which is in the strategy of community organizing, you win local battles. And then once you've done that, then you build the power from below. And, um, and, and I think you know, that we, you know, we, we have a similar argument about the power issue here, that income inequality is a problem because of the power imbalances. It's what Jaffa was saying about it destroyed democracy. And this is why we should do something about it. Um, and, and, and I think that could be a, a good narrative to mobilize people that, that too much concentration in, in, in too few hands is undermining our, our common life. And um, on the point about the capabilities approach, I fully agree. It has been so much co-opted and misunderstood and sometimes utilized to justify a very neoliberal agenda about choice, um, which is not at all what you know, Sen uh, had in mind. Um, and, um, but I wonder whether we, we have kind of lost as well the, the human rights discourse. You know, we, it's been well known that rights have a much more mobilizing power than the notion of functioning as capabilities. You know, just, I think we always have to remember that, that Sen um, introduce his capability approach within within the context of utilitarianism and social choice, um, and uh, and I think you know, we we have you know, if we put that back in context, we kind of um, have to we put different things and capabilities into you know, not give it that prominent uh, position. Uh, and Sen himself, Sen is very angry whenever he's associated with the capability approach, and uh, um, he's, you know, his idea of justice is much more, much more than than capabilities. Um, but yeah, we haven't talked much about rights here. Um, but um, but w w would it be worth to go back to the notion of rights as a mobilizing concept? You no, know, the right to water. And we mentioned it in the policy mix, um, the universal social policy, you know, something that Diego has uh, worked a lot on. Um, but this idea that every human being by, has a right by virtue of being human to water, to food, to health, uh, to clean air, to clean water, um, whether that could be, you know, can we cover that as a mobilizing concept? Um, but and then I'll have a short question for, um, for for the panel, for, for for the audience, or even for ourselves. What is the role of academia? Now I fully agree that arguments have never changed the world. Well, maybe they have. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, but universities still have a role to play in in framing minds. I would say. Um, and I think what, and what Peter was saying uh, in Zambia. Uh, if we form people, I think this, the issue of formation is also critical. Uh, it's not just about mobilizing, but also about forming. And, and here, arguments and universe, universities to play a huge role in, in forming people. Thank you so much, Severin. Just to say that um, 
uh, some world famous economist, John Maynard Keynes, does disagree tremendously with you, Severin, and with you, Ben, on the role of ideas and academic ideas, and he does think that they change the world. I, I'm not suggesting that I um, Keynes in that way, but, but we should remember that there's people that have more faith in uh, the role of academic ideas than, than others. Pilato, um, I wonder whether you have um, want to address any of the questions. Yeah, I would be, I would be quick to, re, to also respond to a Peter, uh, Peter's question. Especially, uh, am I clear? Am I, am I, am I, am I, am I there? No, they are. It's not. Yeah, so let's just speak to uh, Peter's question, uh, which he correctly and 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 uh, presented. Oh, can I? Can I? Uh, how is that? Now is much better. Yo. Sorry. Yeah, oh, is that good? Okay. Okay. So, uh, for through my work and time, I've learned that you you cannot communicate a concept as inequality to people whose education has not been uh, expanded or understanding of this concept. So what I do, and for me this works, is where uh, I go through uh, zero areas. And then you speak to people from the basics, people, things that they understand. You let them appreciate the fact that what they may not have access to is easily accessed by other people in the other group. I'll give you an example. So I've been to Western province in Zambia, the same ponds that they are cattle also drink from. And then you sit them down and say, do you understand that this is wrong? This is not how people live in other places within Zambia. From that point, people begin to get interested in understanding what is the standard? What, 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 should, be, what should they expect? I believe that once people know better, then they will demand better. We may not be in a position to educate millions and take millions to school, but if we can speak to them about ideas that are relatable, if we can speak to people about their rights and what they need to expect from their government, what they should, should be able to demand, I think for me that creates a basis for for them to mobilize and, and 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 campaign over issues of inequality. We may not give them a full curriculum, but from from what they understand, from what they relate to, if we can build from what they know and understand and experience, like I said, inequality for so many of us and so many of our people. It's not an academic question. It's a reality. So they understand from what they experience, from what they know, you pick it from there and do the campaign uh, around those issues. That works for me. And right now, as I'm speaking, I'm not home. I'm somewhere on the copper belt with a lot of young people who I'm speaking to on these issues of inequality. And at every meeting, at every meeting that we have, you get people to, get these young people to even uh, ask you questions that should be directed to the authority. Because they, because they begin to understand that they do have a responsibility to speak and, uh, and demand for that which belongs to them. So uh, for Peter, I think it starts with speaking to people that already understand things that relate to their reality, things that they can easily understand and uh, articulate. If you build from there, you slowly get to uh, argue bigger uh, or, or bigger arguments with the people that should be able to guarantee equality and, and good life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pilato. Um, Jafar, any... Yeah. Yeah, for any... Go. yeah, thank you. 
a little bit unfair because I'm coming at the last end and uh, all of them have skipped me. <laughs> so, but anyway, I will promise anyway, to let you talk anyway, first no, next time. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think one of the problems that we have uh, in the last many years I have been around in many conferences is that I think we, it's good to talk about the problems and what problems we have. But in my opinion, that uh, we are doing that a lot and nobody is coming with any solutions, you know. So I will say, uh, usually, I will push for people to say, okay, we know the problems. We have known them for decades. But what are, what, what are the solutions? Come with them and then join and then, you know, uh, go together and uh, try to solve them. But uh, one of my, my answers to uh, my friend here the, who, who asked the question was, is of course, education. If people don't even know that they are poor or what position they are in, education, of course, is the main thing to get the people to be aware of what's happening, what is happening to them. And of course, in the, the third country, especially in Africa, we know that the, the rich country has to come up with the help that the United Nations has suggested many years ago. So the 0.7% uh, for each country uh, to, to give to, uh, to help the poor countries is not even achieved yet. We have few countries that give the 0.7%, Sweden give 1%, but many of the countries, some are not giving at all, or some are still on something like 0.1, 2 or 3%. We have to push for that. And another solution to uh, what we should demand is, of course, like I said, we should put the, some of the money from the top 1% down. And that's why we are going out loudly and has said it for many years now. We want a 1% levy from the top 1% to go to the SDGs and solve our global problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so let me go back to the public one. I'm, I'm conscious of time now, but um, so I had a Seren who wanted to the floor to ask a question, I think to Ben. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. But to get started, I would like to, to comment on the academia uh, question that came up. I, I think we do need academia. In fact, I think uh, we need uh, what I call the APC plus alliance, that is academia, business, civil society, and politics. Uh, so that's just to get started. And then a question to Ben. I mean, don't we need to take um, all your great recommendations to a global level as well? Uh, uh, and I guess the answer is yes, uh, but then the question is how? I mean, because the global public is very, very, very fragmented. Uh, so how on earth are we going to do that? Um, I do understand the points of starting out locally, uh, but that too could lead to a too fra a fragmented approach uh, as an answer to a, to a problem, which uh, at its core is, is a global problem. Um, so how to take this to a, a global level, uh, taking into account that what we, has done, what we have done so far has not been very good. I mean, we are not very good at activism on a global level. I mean, we have all these petitions, we have a vast, um, where you can sign all sorts of petitions and, and 80 million people have, have done that so far, all sorts of petitions. But honestly speaking, we need to take activism to the next level, uh, way beyond uh, petitions. Uh, but the question is how on earth are we going to do that? Thank you much, Sorin. Um, so Niam, you have an excellent question on, on meritocracy. I don't know if you want to ask it or um, you would prefer that I read it. Um, you can read it if you want. <laughs> no, no, I prefer that you say, now that you have the floor, it would be fantastic. And it's a fantastic one. So if you don't mind saying, um, that would be great. Yeah, okay. Um, so as I said, I am a teenager in the UK. Um, so I go to a state school. So I just wonder, talking about power inequality, how can that be addressed when the education system is set up to promote the supposed meritocracy, which many people now believe is the reason why inequality is justified? But I would say that this is a myth. And without the realisation that 
power inequality is unjust and can produce poverty. How are people from lower classes or, you know, the supposed bottom of the hierarchy supposed to realise this? Is there a solution to inequality when, as said already, people do not realise the meritocracy is more of a narrative used to reinforce the social class divide? Thank you so much. And, and I think this, this links to something that Severin was saying, and it's, it's particularly important. So I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned it. Um, Rachel. Are you yes, with sorry, I'm just trying to unmute myself. Um, Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> my question is, is quite similar to, to the gentleman who came before. But yeah, how do you, you know, I agree that this, that, that the local um, organization is super important, but what does that mean for the international community? And particularly, for, I think for the world, because of course the UN can do lots of good things, educating children, feeding people, etc. But for the World Bank and the IMF that look to sort of build economies, where, particularly when they're working in countries that um, have, have very small economies where you have very little to work with or tax, um, I see that often the, the the drive is to is to kind of focus on economic growth, um, which is often connected to building ports, infrastructure, things that only people who really have money to invest in businesses to export can really take advantage of. Um, but there doesn't seem to be very many other options for these kinds of um, organizations working in very low income countries. So what how should these organizations be looking at um, global inequality when they're dealing with constraints like very small existing economic uh, capacity, et cetera? Thank you so much. Um, and finally, giving time, Gary, I, I think you have a, what I think is a great question about how we use terms and terminology. So I wonder whether you want to ask it. Uh, yes, sure, I can do. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on, um, uh, I, I suppose it's an observation really about, about uh, language and the way we pitch things and this idea of narrative. And it was just an observation that, um, uh, and this isn't a criticism, it's just an observation that all of the uh, speakers, who've all been excellent by the way, and thank you for such a great event, this is great. But all of the speakers have used a kind of an analogy, a narrative of uh, there are people at the top and there are people at the bottom. And I was just wondering whether that narrative in itself uh, is actually hugely problematic and uh, needs to be challenged as it potentially does so many people a huge disservice. It, it ignores their inherent moral worth as human beings and uh, therefore takes away from what we understand by the very nature of humanity itself. So um, it's a kind of, I suppose it's a kind of a philosophical point, but it also might lead to some practical uh, implications about how we understand the top and bottom of what, what are we talking about? It's similar to the, to the question of uh, equality of, of what. So it was just another question to, uh, to, uh, about, about that narrative of, of top and bottom. I think it's it's fantastic, and and I I for example keep talking about the top one percent, which is popular, and I can promise you after after your reminder that using the wealthiest or the richest ten one percent, I think it's a much better term than the top because language is important, and and that's why I I thought your comment is particularly well taken. So let me um, I I want to be British, so I want to finish on time, so I want to give. Uh, each of you two minutes, but in this case, to please ask you to, to talk um, for two minutes about these three last questions or any other reflections you have about the discussion. And I'm going to actually reverse orders this time. So Jafar, the floor is, is yours for any last comment. Thank you. Uh, I think if uh, I look at the institutions globally that we have today, it's all been established after the Second War. What you can say, the winners of the Second War, with the US at the top, uh, with Russia, uh, Europe, and so on, uh, establish the, the systems that we have today. Uh, if you take the World Bank, the US is sitting heavily on it. If you take the UN again, you have few countries have the veto right to veto everything else. 
So I think it's time now that we change all that. We have to change it so we have a sustainable affair system and we don't have it today. And in the short term, we need the UN to step in. They have worked hard on the sustainable development goals. They are screaming for financing. They, can't, they cannot find the trillions. So we need the UN to come together and put a levy, uh, uh, as we said, where the money is and uh, establish uh, some kind of fairness that we can remove the 1 billion extreme poverty, the 6 million children that are dying every year, 265 million children who are not going to school and so on and so on. I think it's time that humanity comes together and solve the biggest uh, question of our time, and especially the climate change. Because if we are not addressing that, the climate will take us out and the extreme inequality will take us out. We know that in the next 10, 20 years, just in Africa, there will be 1 billion people more. They will come to Europe and other places and we will have an unsafe world. So we have to tackle that, uh, that now and come together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Pilato. Uh, for me, my closing remarks would be, uh, first of all, we must understand that when we are demanding for justice, economic justice and all of that, we're not demanding it in abstract. We are demanding it from people that have exploited another class or group of people and they've advantaged themselves and they've continued to advantage themselves. So our demand is clear. So if we, for our case, where we feel it is the political elite that people, we demand it from them, specifically from them, and demand that they, first of all, address the issues at the bottom, address the issues of the people. The development, the greatest expression of de development is that which happens on the people. You cannot build roads for us if we cannot afford to use the roads. You cannot build uh, shopping malls for us if we cannot buy or afford the things that are being sold in these shopping malls. So in addressing inequality, our position is that we will not ask it from God or from the devil. No, no, we'll ask equality from the people that have rig the system, made it a sport. They want to become the richest men, the richest women at the expense of so many people. We demand it from the people that are advantaging themselves and disadvantaging the, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pilato. Severin. Just to, to, to add to, to the, the matters of, of further questions, um, we haven't talked much about the level at which we need to fight inequality. I think what came up in the discussion was that there's a local, there's a national, there is the global, especially. You know, Jaffa, when you're mentioning the role of the UN and the uh, um, and is there a case for establishing a global fund? You know, Jaffa, you, you made really the case that structural change needs to happen and that only comes with taxation. And for the moment, we only have national systems of taxation. Um, could we think about a global system of taxation? And I know that's been you know, quite thought about for a long time. And, and it's true that the World Bank IMF have been set up for uh, their post-war institutions and and is it not time to have post-COVID-19 institutions uh, to, to deal with, with all that? Um, and the question on meritocracy and education, I mean, that's absolutely, I think, essential, um, especially in the British context or in other contexts too. I think, you know, Diego, you were saying that in, um, in your, your book that one school in Brazil um, was charging $10,000 for one year. Um, the elite school, uh, and so how the education system is reproducing inequality and, and reproducing that narrative of meritocracy, and um, is and how to address that. And I think that's that that's key, uh, and that that probably goes back to this, this issue of universal services, um, good education for all, not just for those who, who can't afford it. Um, and 
yeah, so I'll, um, I'll stop here. But I think there's a lot of food for thought here. Uh, and then what I will take away is not only the issue of narrative, but also the the local, the local level, national and global level, um, and how do we have structural change at, at all these levels and how they interact. I think that's something for us to continue thinking about and analyzing cases of, of success. Um, what are the success stories um, that are fighting inequality in the sense I would say power inequality, especially. Thank you so much, Severin. Ben. Um, such great questions. Um, thank you, I was so inspired. And particularly uh, uh, the question from Neve, is, is that how you say your name? About um, uh, the meritocracy, but also about um, kind of the experience of young people. Um, I want to get you a copy of the book because I just thought everything you said was brilliant and uh, you are a change maker. So I'll talk to Joe and we'll try and find a way to get you a copy of the book. Um, when we look at history, so many of the change makers of history have been very, very young. You know, apartheid would not have fallen, was it not for the school kids in 1976 um, who took to the streets in Soweto and said, we refuse to learn Afrikaans, the language of the colonizer as our primary uh, language. Their, their role in bringing down that system was absolutely fundamental. People like Congressman John Lewis were teenagers when they started engaging in the civil rights uh, movement in the States. I couldn't find a successful social movement where there wasn't an important student contingent. I was often looking at university students, but you do also see about the important role of high school students too. Um, my own daughter got involved in Fridays for Future, which is a group of kids who sometimes take Fridays off to protest for the climate. But it was fascinating seeing how that group that she got involved in were, then ended up being the organizers, we live in Rome, ended up being the organizers in Rome of the Black Lives Matter march when George Floyd was murdered. So kids who'd organized around climate um, made the transition to organizing around racial justice. And it was beautiful to see the interconnectedness of that, but it was also beautiful to see how much of a kind of, you know, organizing is kind of gateway drug. You just get into it on one thing and you'll keep going on others and you'll find other social justice issues. So I hope that what you'll do with your fellow students is not accept a hierarchical position where you're just there to learn. I love the point that was made about who's at the top and who's at the bottom. There's no one's been left behind. People have been pushed behind. And um, your experience and what you're raising is valid and it, it's important. And so I hope that you will continue to be insistent and undeferential um, because every change maker has been undeferential. The, to end, people raised this uh, role of academics. Now, I think academics have a key role. You know, policy matters, being right matters. The challenge then is how do you actually turn it into practice? I would love to see more academics, not just writing to hand over to policy elite, but academics seeing themselves as partners, kind of um, uh, helping share what they know and also learn from others um, of those who are engaged in social change. I'd also love to see more academics engage in those how questions, not just what's the best policy mix we need, but how has it happened in the past? What were the elements? And help people, help skill people up. We have schools for people who wanna be in business, right? The, the business schools at universities like Harvard Business School or Said. We have schools for people that want to be um, the change makers in government, like the, Harvard, like the Kennedy School or like Blavatnik in Oxford. Where is the organizing school? It doesn't exist. Now, people like MST, the uh, agricultural workers in Brazil have uh, a place outside Sao Paulo where they tried to do this. Uh, Rosa Parks was trained at the Highland Folk School in the US, which was just last year burnt down by, by racists because they know the power of these organizing schools. But there's very few. They're not backed by academia. I'd love to see them play a role. In the Montgomery bus boycott, the 381 days where black people refused to take the bus until the bus companies surrendered uh, their hor horrific policy that forced them to the back. 381 days, they held out the strike. Now, what role did the academics play? And this is a beautiful story because the academics didn't drive it intellectually. The academics weren't in charge. The academics were asked principally to do one thing. And that was, can you print some leaflets? And it's really important. It was a really important role because at that time in the Southern states of the US, the only people who had access to printers that could print those pamphlets and posters and leaflets for the boycott were people at university. And so university staff risked their jobs, many lost their jobs illegally 
printing out manually loads and loads of leaflets. I love that story because what they did was they mucked in. They didn't say, I'm here from the outside to advise you guys to do. They got their hands dirty. They took literally dirty printing the posters. They took risks um, and they got involved. They weren't a witness and they weren't a guru. They were a buddy. Um, and really in the work of social change, what we lack is enough buddies. So the more that we can gather, uh, the more we have a chance of winning. But it was really beautiful to be together with all of you. Um, and I'm so grateful to Pilato, who's, who's you know, a real brave, courageous hero making change, uh, to, to Jaffa, who you know, could have emerged from his life of having made it from an immigrant child of a single mum to being a millionaire, could have then said, sod the rest of you and put, kick the ladder away and instead devoting his energies to trying to get governments to make him pay more tax. Um, and Severine, who has just takes uh, theology and takes uh, th these religious ideas, which are often only often discussed, you know, in kind of seminaries or amongst the, the ultra faithful and brings them to this much more um, uh, secular audience. And we really need those values. We really need to put values back at the heart of it. So I'm so grateful to be on a panel with such special people. And Diego, so grateful for you for pulling it all together. Thank you. You are the, that buddy academic that uh, social justice movements need. Thank you so much. That um, is very beautiful. And uh, I'm glad for everyone. Um, I think we, we had a long and broad discussion about issues that um, are about many uh, things. Um, I think it, it was inspiring in many ways. But I also think that as uh, Severin says, it leaves us with a lot of questions to continue thinking about in a discussion that I do think will have an academic component, but of course it will have a component about actions. Um, ben, we are also um, very thankful to you, uh, not just for the nice words at the end, but also because uh, in many ways you pull um, this group together. So um, thank you so much everyone for coming. Um, and um, this is clearly um, a discussion both intellectually, but also in terms of action that is uh, just starting and that has a long um, way to go. And we hope to organize and do more around those issues. Bye everyone.